There's no doubt that there's, there's a, an iconic look to seeing a band playing in front of a wall of, you know, a stack of Marshall speakers. It's almost the look of rock and roll. No sooner had Cream reached their peak, an earthquake hit Britain. There was a sort of hierarchy of London guitar players. When Hendrix arrived, it was like, OK, everybody budge up one. Within days of arriving in the UK, the young Hendrix had formed his three-piece band, but needed equipment. Drummer Mitch Mitchell was a former drum pupil of Jim's, and soon an introduction was made. I think Jimmy came along at the right time, as far as the Marshall amplifiers were concerned. So Jimmy not only appreciated the fact that I made the amplifier with the sound that he wanted, but also his name was James Marshall Hendrix, and he got a kick out of that as well. Jimmy met Jim in the Hanwell shop, and an order was placed for three Marshall 100 watt super lead stacks. They became the unmistakable Hendrix back line. With Jimi Hendrix, immediately he started playing guitar in Britain. All these great guitarists, the, the, the Eric Clapton's and Peter Green's and, and Pete Townsend's and Keith Richards, and all just went, wow. It was a fabulous screaming sound, and you got the sense of the guy playing through feedback. Again, Marshall was at the center. You know, Clapton was God, but Jimmy killed God, man. The Marshall name, it's like Jimi Hendrix, Clapton and Cream, The Who, Marshall. And we all had stacks. <laughs> Britain was in the grips of a deep counterculture. The message was turn on, tune in, and drop out. It was also a time of change for the sleepy hamlet of Milton Keynes near Bletchley, 50 miles north of London. With growing international sales, the company had outgrown the tiny London factory. The new town was offering generous relocation grants and Jim put the idea to the workforce. We went to lots of discussions on different places and things we were going to do, but it opened up that Bletchley were offering uh, factories, accommodation for workers, um, and it looked quite promising. Jim led the way north. First few weeks, I know they were all sleeping in the factory. Virtually all the staff followed. As rock developed in the late 60s, the supergroup began harnessing the power of the pounding guitar riff. Jimmy Page of Led Zeppelin was an absolute master. It's impossible to overstate how big Led Zeppelin were. They were absolutely massive. They were the Beatles of the 70s in terms of popularity levels. And, you know, I traveled with Robert quite a lot during that time. And, uh, you know, one of the challenges was to figure out how to fill an entire stadium with that sound. I think that the change came in that later part of the 60s when somebody developed proper public address systems that were designed for music, not saying, would the owner of vehicle, because you could now have amps that were as loud as hell. The Marshall amp as a back line, well, there was nothing, nothing better. It was like opening, a, opening the doors, and there we are. We're away now. The age of the festival had arrived, and amplification had to raise its game to match. It was just exactly like it was supposed to sound. All the other amps, you had to like twiddle to try and get it back to like normal. Whereas with the Marshall, you just plug it in and it's like, like it's supposed to be. The spectacle that Paul Costa with his legs apart, with his head back like a lion roaring, wailing on his Les Paul, it was just, it was just like a spectacle of biblical proportions to, a, to somebody at 15, 16 years old. Everything was 10 for Paul. All the knobs went to the right. And, that's, and he'd stand as close or as far away as he wanted to do for the feedback that he wanted to use you know, and just play. In the next episode, the high volume race begins. We bought stacks for ourselves and, and started to build that reputation as the loudest band in the world. <laughs>